I really had hoped to write fiction one day, and it wasn't until my early 40s that I began to turn to that. And my first novel, The Secret Life of Thieves, was not published until I was 53 years old. Right about now. One, one, two, two, three, three, hit me. Right about now. Right about now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Right About Now podcast. My name is Jonathan Small. It is a pleasure to have you with me today. What a great show. Sue Monk Kid, she's like a national treasure, huge, huge writer, joins us on the program in just a few moments. Sue just released a brand new book called The Book of Longings, in which she imagines that Jesus himself was in a married relationship. It is a beautiful story, and I'm very excited to talk to her about it. If you are not familiar with Sue Monk Kidd, listen to these credentials. Her debut novel, The Secret Life of Bees, spent more than 100 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It sold more than 6 million copies in the U.S. and was turned into an award-winning major motion picture and a musical and has been translated into 36 languages. She followed that up with The Mermaid Chair, which was also a number one New York Times bestseller and was adapted into a TV movie. And her third novel, The Invention of Wings, was an Oprah Book Club 2.0 pick. So Sue is among one of the most successful writers in this country or anywhere. And we really get down into the details of how She writes the books that she writes, what her process is, which was super fascinating. I found myself taking notes while she was talking, which was probably extremely distracting to her to hear me scribbling and seeing like, can you, can you just hold on a minute? Can you just wait a minute? I just got to write that point down. I think you'll feel the same way. This is like a masterclass in the process of how to write a novel and why not have one of the great novelists uh, teach you how to do it. So check out my interview with Sue and I hope you very much enjoy this episode. Sue Monk Kid, welcome to the Write About Now podcast. Well, it's lovely to be with you. Thank you. I really enjoyed your book and love your writing in general. I'm a big fan. And I think you know, before we start talking about the Book of Longing, I just wanted to give our audience a little bit of your backstory because it's interesting because you came into writing a little bit later in your life. So I was wondering if you could just Tell us a little bit about how you got started in writing, because my understanding is that you your first career was as a nurse, correct? That's correct, yes. I graduated from high school in the 60s, and at that time, you were either a nurse or a teacher or a librarian. Or, I mean, it was very limiting in, in many ways for women and, and the way we thought about or envisioned what we would do. And so I chose nursing, and I worked for about, a, let's see, a decade as a registered nurse. And it's a very noble, wonderful profession, but it just wasn't my true north, if you know what I mean. It wasn't my home inside. <clears throat> and so um, I had always wanted to be a writer, even as a child. It was it felt almost innate in me. I was telling people I was going to grow up and be a writer when they asked you that question, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I would say a writer. Um, but when it came time, it was either a failure of courage or a lack of support from the whole world. I'm not sure what it was, <laughs> but I ended up a nurse. On my 30th birthday, I came into the kitchen where my husband was feeding the two toddlers and I announced that I was going to be a writer and they all kind of looked at me and said great mom you know (laughs) and that was that but that was my beginning Um, and I never looked back after that I mean I just made some it was just a moment of decision for me where I said, I'm going to do what I really need to do. And fortunately, I got a lot of support from my family who allowed us to, you know, have to do some freelancing in order to make ends meet. But it was a beginning. 
and that's how it started. Yeah. What was it about writing that so resonated with you that made it that you just couldn't live without doing it? Yes. What is that? It's a hunger and a need, and I think it's a creative instinct. It's just so many things in us, and if you've got it, you know it, because it won't let you be. So I I really feel like for myself, that need to write was with me very, very early. And I don't mean by that that it has to be. You have to be born with it. I don't really believe that. I think people can acquire this all through their lives. And it evolves in lots of ways, as it did for me, because I started off when I was 30 and took this trip. With It was all about nonfiction, because I really did need to support my family and help do that. And I was writing articles and essays and newspaper pieces and inspirational pieces and all kinds of things. But um, I really had hoped to write fiction one day, and it wasn't until my early 40s that I began to turn to that. And my first book, the, uh, my I should say not my first book, my first novel, The Secret Life of Thieves, was not published until I was 53 years old. So, you know, if you're, if you're waiting, um, thinking you're too old to do it, you're never too old. Do it. My father is 98 years old, and he writes articles all the time. So I think it's just a number in your head, and do you should just go do what you want to do. That's amazing. 53, I love that. And your first novel then ends up being this unbelievable international bestseller. It's a wonderful book, The Secret Life of Bees. Did it surprise you, the success of it? From my head to my toe, yes. <laughs> It was not something I saw coming at all. Yeah. It must have completely changed your life. You know, it did in many ways. I had to adapt to that, and it could be both wondrous and exciting and also challenging in in some ways. I just wanted to write initially a a novel that would be respectable, you know, that might get a a few good reviews and some nice readers and my mother would be proud and all of that but I never imagined we would end up with this many readers and all that evolved out of it and I had to get my head around that a little bit it, it took me a, um, some time to do that actually many people dream of being a writer and maybe you know getting published but then to be published then to be like suddenly like almost a celebrity writer Did it change the sort of trajectory of your career? Did you feel a lot of pressure once you had that kind of success? Oh, my God, I have to follow it up with another great book. and Or was it just an enjoyable? Yeah, you said it. You said it right there. (laughs) It was a lot of pressure on the second novel. There is a kind of second novel syndrome that, you know, writers talk about. Anyway, no matter how successful your first one is, it's like the follow-up. It's like the sophomore failure they talk about. So there's that already in your head. But I felt a lot of expectations about my writing the next book, that I had to live up to something. It probably was my own artificial ideas about it. But I did have an interviewer ask me as I was writing my my second, just had written maybe a chapter or two of my second novel, The Mermaid Chair, who said, how does it feel to have written your best book first? Oh, man. And I paused. Yeah, that was a loaded one. And I thought, wow, I could write 10 more books and nobody's going to think they're any good because they can't live up or measure up to the first one. So that was a blow to in a way, uh, I, I began to, at that point, get what my only case in my whole life that I've had, really, of writer's block. And I was a little stymied after that. It took me three months to get my head on straight about it and to realize that I didn't have to live up to those 
expectations. What were they anyway? I just needed to write the best book I could and to follow my own instincts and desires and best judgment and just do the best I could and enjoy it and offer it and it would be what it would be. And that's a hard lesson, but I finally got it and I never did look back after that. Well, I hope I don't ask any questions that give you writer's block. <laughs> it sounds like that interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you just don't know the power you really have. Yes, <laughs> we, these podcasters can ruin a person's uh, creative flow. Well, what's amazing is you ended up really actually writing two, you know, wonderful, well, now three wonderful books after that. It seems like you really just write what you're interested in writing, and that seems to be the secret power of, you know, aside from your raw talent of, you know, not trying to write for anybody else. You're writing what you're interested in writing about, right? It seems like the trap you can fall into is now saying, oh God, I have to write another secret of life of the bees. Yeah, absolutely. I just write what comes to me from my heart, I'm going to say, to write. There, I just feel like there is this wellspring inside of us, this creative interior life, if you will. And it's so rich and amazing. And if we can tap into that, we find um, so many images and things that fascinate us. And I just try to see what images float up to me and what, how they affect me and what if something truly fascinates me and if it will kind of take root and sprout. And, and if it does, I follow it. Now, m- all of my books are really different. In one on American slavery, one set in the first century, one about a midlife marriage, one about a southern coming of age. So they seem very different. There was a kind of authentic pull in me to write each one of them although everybody wanted me to write a sequel to The Secret Life of Bees. But I believe that our success and our power as writers lies in following this authenticity and listening to this creative voice in ourselves. That's not to say we don't listen to people around us who have good advice for us, but you know what I mean. Yeah, totally. Can we talk a little bit about your process? And we can use the Book of Longings um, as as an example of how you come up with a book and how, you know, from sort of the idea to the actual finished product. And I don't know if it's similar for every book that you've worked on, if you've evolved your process over time. But I had read that there's sort of two things that you say that you look for and then in that when you're starting a project and that is who is your character, you know, who, who are the characters, the main characters and what and what do they long for? Is that accurate? That's right. Those, that is very accurate. In fact, those two questions are so important for me to come up with answers that I will say it like this. The whole story hangs on those for me. And if I can find the answers to those two questions in a very satisfying way, I have the whole story in a nugget right there. And, and I trust that it will grow out of those answers. So I put a lot of stock in them. For instance, who who is my character? I will write pages and pages and dream on that and think about that and reflect on it and take walks and imagine this character. And I want to know her or, or him very well. And then I ask myself, and what does she want? What does she long for? And um, that's the motivation, of course, for the story. And I like it to be something of magnitude because the the stakes need to be pretty high, uh, whether they're emotional stakes or something else. You want there to be something at risk here. And if she doesn't achieve this longing, there's enormous loss or tragedy about it in my mind. So that's how I start off asking those two questions. Not to simplify it too much, <laughs> because it's it's much more complex than that. But I'm sure it is, and you probably have to give. And you do this for each of your characters, or just for sort of the main characters, protagonist, antagonist. Mainly the main character. I do write character sketches for my other main characters with the Book of Longings. I do what I call notebooks, and I line them up on my desk, and uh, I have research notebooks just 
oh, so many of those because there was just way too much research for this book. And then I have a book of characters, and I keep a list of character names, and I keep profiles of the main characters and kind of what they want or what they're about and what their background is and you know what they look like, descriptions, all kinds of things like that that I will refer to a lot. But I'm old school enough to believe in a plot. I mean, I like a good story. I like a... I know you yeah, do. You're a, so good at telling stories. I don't maybe. Know. <laughs> um, but I, I know I want it to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I want it to flow like a real story. I mean, I have read Virginia Woolf, but it, it is so stream of consciousness. I don't think I could ever write that. I admire her work, but she's hard for me sometimes because I want the story to be more concrete. But having said that, for me, there are two parts of it. There's the narrative that I love to invent, and there is the language that I also love to invent. And I'm just in love with words. I just love creating sentences and stringing words together. So they're equally important in my mind. And the narrative is something that I have a process for that, which involves a collage, though I think that's pretty old school too. And maybe there's a word for that that I don't know of. I don't think it's storyboard, but it's something. But I clip images for my story because I am so visual and I put them on a big board. And are these and images from magazines? For every novel. Magazine. Yeah. Yeah. I keep magazines and postcards and flyers and <laughs> all kinds of things in a, in a big box. Uh, I'll just toss things in it. And when it comes time to create the novel, I will get all this out. It's like a being, it's so fun. I mean, it's kind of like playing and having an art and craft day. <laughs> Yes, exactly. You're just doing it. Maybe it's the old school way to do it, but then they've just made it into a digital version. And I think they call sometimes they call those mood boards or it just kind of gives you. But there are, you go. But it gives you a feeling of what the characters look like, what this, the, the environment they inhabit is like, that kind of idea. Well, in some ways, yes. I mean, I, what I do is if I see an image that intrigues me, I mean, I generally know what, you know, this is a story about this, but I don't really know the details of the story. I will um, just see an image and I'll not try to figure it out. I'll just put it uh, in a pile and paste them all together. Now, with the Secret Life of Bees collage, I clipped out and pasted on a riotously pink house. I didn't know there was going to be a pink house in this book, but it turned out to be a big pink house. And... I put a um, picture of three African-American women who looked kind of like sisters to me. I didn't know what they meant because I hadn't developed those characters yet of August, May, and June. And there they were. That's how I found them. They were on that board. And the other thing that not everything on my collage ends up in my story. And I don't try to think too consciously about it. I feel like because it is a effort at some art piece, and I say that loosely, it would be unconscious almost. So you just kind of let your unconscious have reign with that and see what comes up. The Wailing Wall in The Secret Life of Bees was an image on my first collage that I didn't know would be in there. So I utilize that process to help me develop the narrative. It seems like something that should be in a museum right? Your collages for each of your books. <laughs> are, they, are they tucked away in a closet oh, somewhere? My. They are. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be giving all of this, The they call them archives now. I never thought I would have archives, but I apparently I do, to the College of Charleston. So they'll be available for people to, and be digitalized and people can look at them. Do you ever Is use it, the website Pinterest? Have you heard about Pinterest? Yes, I have. Uh huh. I don't have a an account or whatever you have. Pinterest yeah. is sort of the digital version of what you're doing, but I kind of like your way of doing it more because it's very manual and it probably 
requires, I don't know, your, a different part of your brain to be used when you're doing it that way. Yeah, I think so. It's like the collages that my daughter, my, my 11, 10 year old daughter puts together of all these different magazine images, mm-hmm. and, you know, puts them all over her wall. Um, That's right. Yeah. They look very, they look very like a school girl did it, <laughs> but they're very important to me in my process. Yeah. I mean, I had also, in, in keeping with that, so in the Book of Longings, there was a apparently an, an incantation bowl, which I didn't even know what that was. I had to look up what an incantation bowl was. There was something about that bowl, and when you saw a picture of it, that gave you all sorts of ideas for, you, for your main character, Anna. That came out of my research, yes. When I discovered that, I got very excited because I knew this would be a nice, almost like a spiritual icon that would travel through the story. Most of my novels, let's see, I think every one of my four novels has something like a spiritual icon in it, I call it. And it's a symbolic piece that carries something of the character's longings or something of the motif of the story or the heart of the story. And in this one, it is the incantation bowl. And they were actual first century and even earlier bowls where people would write their prayers or their curses or all kinds of things in a spiraling fashion at the bottom of inside these bowls. And when I read about them, I thought, ah, this is what I'm going to give to my character, Anna. And she's going to write the prayer of her heart in it, her longing, her deepest longing. And it becomes visible for the reader. It's not just an abstraction, which is, it's significant to do that, I think, to make our uh, motivations concrete as we can, to give them a, a shape and a form and an image that the reader can hold on to. So it brings them forth, I think, in a more vivid way. And when you give characters like Anna longings and you and you sketch them out, obviously you're going to also give them obstacles, right, to those longings. Otherwise, you don't have a story. So is, there, is that part of the process? Like, what does she want and what gets in her way to not wanting that? What's the conflict? Absolutely, because you're right. If without it, there is no story. So the f- next thing I do after I know the longings is to un- try to see what are the forces that will thwart that in the character. Um, someone asked me once, "What? <laughs> here's a question for you. What is a novel? And I said, I, I thought, wow, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. But what came to me and what I said was, well, you just take a bad situation and make it worse. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of it, you know. You, you take a situation and, and you have forces that push the character forward and then forces that compel the character back. And that's your conflict, of course. And maybe the most, I think it was Faulkner who said that the most interesting or, or needed conflict is the one that takes place in the human heart. Just a conflict, two conflicting things in the human heart. And those maybe are the most interesting. It's, it's interesting, though, that the conflicts you're talking about are our own, of our own making or uh, in our own sort of interior worlds. And yet... Sometimes conflicts can come in the form of, of another person, right? An antagonist or a, a character that kind of gets mm-hmm. in the way, like a Judas, say. Yeah, you need that. You do need it. Yeah, you definitely need it in the form of a person as well. Yeah. Um, I think you need them. They can be in many forms, you know. It can be um, a wind in the tree, <laughs> so kind of thing. But I look for them both outwardly and inwardly. Now, let's talk about the Book of Longings. So... I saw a picture. You, you, you do these whiteboards of all the different characters, and then there's kind of like a, um, arrows, you know, different. Uh, tell me a little bit about that whiteboard that you 
that you <laughs> that you showed a picture of. What yeah. is on that? There's a lot of you have a lot of material that you're working with. You have collages and notebooks and whiteboards. It must be hard to keep track of all that. Yeah, stuff. I do. <laughs> it's chaotic. It really is. But isn't that what creation is? We brood over the chaos, right? <laughs> I think that's biblical, actually. <laughs> so I don't. Yeah, something like that. But it's hard in a way. You want to run away from chaos, but I like to collect and gather just tons of stuff, images, notebooks full of notes and books. And then I create a big, what I call my storyboard, although it's probably misnamed too. And I pin up things that are important for me to refer to throughout the entire writing process, which are maybe some dates that I need, the chronology of history during that time because I'm writing historical fiction, some pictures of my characters that I imagine them, just all kinds of things I will pin up. But I also take a whiteboard and with each part of the book, <laughs> I'll see, it's called Aristotle's Incline. Mm. And you can find that online oh, that's easily. Interesting. Yeah. And it's a kind of diagram of the structure of the book. And I love it because it's like a skeleton that I can hang my story on. And it makes it feel substantial, like I know where I'm going and how to get there. So it starts with an opening scene, and there are it works in three acts. And all of my books have been written this way, so that I know kind of what's holding it together underneath. So once you have all this, when do you actually sit down and begin writing the book and do you write it linearly? Do you write it from the beginning to the end or do you write it in sections and then kind of put it together like a collage? I write from beginning to end and I do what most writing teachers would probably tell your audience not to do. So I say this with caution <laughs> um, to, yeah, do not try this at home. But I can't seem to do it any other way and I rewrite as I go. Mm, I do and, the same. You know, do you? Yeah. I, but you, I know that everybody says just write. People. Yeah. Everybody says just write, you know, everything, just put it all out there and then go back and edit it later. I can't do that. I, I'm editing myself as I go. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's yeah, not good. Some people just have a need. <laughs> right. <laughs> it makes so it much that's slower. That's how I do it. And I, yeah. Yes, it does. And that's why I am, it took me four and a half years to write the book. The, the quickest I've ever written a novel was in about two and a half years. And I felt like I was ran, running a marathon. Um, but I, I love to polish and rewrite. I think that my work comes alive in the rewriting, or at least the language does. The narrative may be in the first draft. But I will rewrite and rewrite until I get a certain feeling, <laughs> you know, a sort of intuitive knowing, like, okay, I've, I, I'm done. And I come back in the next morning and I read what I have written, have just been working on, and I might continue to work. But once I decide it's done, I'm, I can move on then. What's the hardest part for you of writing? The beginning. Yeah, the starting. Opening. opening. Yeah. The opening scene. It's not, I'm eager to start, although I did, I got so immersed in the research this time, I almost never got out of that rabbit hole. But I think the openings are hard and you have to put so much into such a short space. And, you know, your character, who is your character? And, I give, try to give a hint of what they want and, well, a strong hint if I can. And their world, we need to see them in their world. And you've got to deliver this without being boring. And I want the reader to be caught up in their world almost immediately. And that's hard. So I probably write it, you know, 20, 30 times I might do it until I finally feel like I... So your opening, you want to introduce the character, but also grip the, grip the reader by the lapels, right? And say, you got to keep reading this book. Kind of like a good lead in yeah. a newspaper story. If yeah. I, yeah, if I possibly can. 
John Irving said something one time that, well, he wrote something that I never forgot, and this was probably 10 years ago, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but it was that when you write a beginning, it should contain everything in the story somehow. <laughs> and that was a, like, seemed like a feat beyond anyone when I first read that. Yeah. Yeah. And I finally realized what he meant, you know, what he was trying to say, or what he said better than I can, I'm sure, is that the story is already in your mind and you want it to be like a seed pod at, in the beginning and the reader kind of knows what the whole story is going to be without really knowing what's going to happen. And so that was why I wrote the opening of of the Book of Longings like I did. And I wrote, I am Anna. I was the wife of Jesus, Ben Joseph of Nazareth. That was the opening two lines. And I wanted to, that tells you pretty much what this whole book is about. And that's what he was trying to say. Yeah, I love that you, I'm just, the fact that it's even I am Anna, it, it says a lot because it, her, she's wanting her voice to be heard throughout the whole book. That's that's her longing is to get her voice out there. And it's not, it doesn't open with, I was the wife of Jesus, right? So like, because then that makes her sort of second fiddle in the story. It's I am Anna, like hear me roar kind of, kind of idea. Yes, you got that perfectly because I, I was quite convinced that she had to come on to the literary page and announce herself, her real self not as a wife or a daughter or a mother or anything else, but just as herself. And that was, that's an important motif in the story, actually. It just seems to be an important motif in all of your stories, is women finding themselves and kind of starting off, not their voice being stifled, and then figuring out a way to make their voices be heard. It seems like an important theme yes, for you. Yes, that is and, a- and and not, it is a theme for me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not to get too uh, psychoanalytical, but it seems like almost a theme for your life, right? So it's like you, you <laughs> your voice might have, you know, you finally were able to really write when you were a little bit later in your life. You know, you felt like, and then and then by the time you're 53, then you're you you're really your voice is being heard in a major way around the world. It's interesting. Why do you think that is so important? Well, to you? I, I, yeah, why is that? I grew up, you know, in this pre-feminist South, as I was saying, and I saw the limitations placed on women. I felt them. And I guess it made an impression on me in the same way that segregation made an impression on me. Both of those things, race and gender, are recurring, deeply held um, themes for me. And so I really think they came out of my history, and I internalized them. Um, I mean, I need, I have a need to write about women striving for identity and fullness of self and independence and freedom in a male world. This is a classic story for women writers <laughs> through the ages. I mean, Jane Eyre, look at that novel. Charlotte Bronte wrote that as well. And But here I am doing it because we're still trying to um, get that across. So I'm not sure I know the answer to why I do that, except that's what I'm about. And it's, but of all the women to choose to write about, you wanted to write about the wife of Jesus, um, or you're imagining what the wife of Jesus might have, who, who that might have been and what she might have longed for. And, and, and apparently this is a, an idea that you had had for a long time, but only now in your life did you feel like you could, you could write this story. What was it about now that you were like, okay, it's time for me to write this story? And what, and what was your hesitation at first? Well, it was around 15 years ago I thought of it, and, and it was not a fully formed and as compelling as it came to me recently. 
it was more of a, I've described it as a fleeting kind of thing that came and didn't find a home really at that time because probably I wasn't ready to write that book. But you get older and you realize you're not going to live forever and you're a little wiser and you have acquired some skills and abilities because you are basically an apprentice and you're always trying to evolve as a writer. So I just felt, okay, let's do it. And I felt ready to do it. And I knew there would be some possible backlash from this with people who didn't appreciate the topic or the premise. Um, But it was my longing to write this story. And I feel like it's an important story for for readers uh, just to imagine that there was a wife. And if she ever existed, and honestly, I have no idea, and I'm not even invested in whether Jesus had a wife or not. But I do think it's important to imagine it. I really do. She's like the missing feminine in religion, and we need that presence. And I, I, there was a question I asked. I wrote it on a card and I put it on my desk. And it was, how would the world have been different if Jesus had had a wife and she had really been part of the narrative? Well, I think it would be really different. And it just feels like writing an alternate history or reimagining history, which is what this is, can help us in the present to think of our past and how it affected us and where we're going and see and envision things differently in the, through our, in the now. So you did so much research on this. Like you said, you fell down a rabbit hole. I mean, how many years of, of research did you do before you even sat down to, to write the first page? Well, it was actually 14 months of nonstop work. I felt like I went to graduate school for 14 months and, and, emerged out the other side of it, but it was an intense experience. Yeah, I collected this little library, yeah, just reading and reading. And I didn't know much about that period, and that period is so interesting of, of history. What did you learn about that period that surprised you, that, you know, that, that isn't in the Bible, that you had, that you had no idea about? Well, something that isn't in the Bible that I didn't know about was this whole city of Sepphoris, which is four miles away from Nazareth, that was the capital of Galilee. And it was described as the real jewel of the Galilee. Um, I didn't know about that because they discovered this, the archaeologists did, it's in ruins, but you can travel there and see it. Um, And so that gave the theologians, or the, perhaps I should say, not the theologians, but the historical Jesus scholars, ways to think differently about him, as in he was so near to this multilingual, sophisticated world that he probably found work there and could speak, read and write. I mean, so there were all kinds of things I found that I had, well, obviously, many things I found that I didn't know that opened up all kinds of possibilities where history and my imagination could intersect. Did you come across any characters that were like Anna or any of the female characters in the book? Well, let's start with Anna because it seems like it, it, is she rooted in something that you read or learned about because she's this like very well educated daughter of a, of a scribe but she seems modern in some ways, but but maybe she isn't. And maybe it's, tell me a little bit about that character. I can't really say that I came across any character like her. Um, she's completely invented. Um, there was nothing to even model her on. But I'm convinced that there were women in that era who longed for the opportunities their brothers had, who who chafed against the um, boundaries of their world. They're, we can't call them feminists, but they had that urge and that need and that 
feeling of being caged and limited, I'm sure, because I just know how women are. So I, I just think, yeah, yeah, I mean, not deep inside. But she, now Yalta, her aunt, who encourages her audacity, who encourages Anna's audacity, they say, um, she was a mythic kind of character in the Talmud and J- Jewish writings used to um, kind of discourage people from being like she was. You know, they would say, don't be like her. Here's what she did, little parables about her. And she was kind of a, a lesson that was used to teach women how to be and not be. So naturally, when I read that, she landed in my book as a character with that name. Oh, that's interesting. That's how you got that name. So yeah. the the other character that must have been very challenging to write is Jesus himself, just because people have such, they already have such preconceived notions in their own experience. It's like you're not inventing a character with Jesus. He's a, the most famous person probably in in the world, right? So how did you, that must have been very hard even to write his dialogue, to think about, how did you, how did you sketch out Jesus's character? Uh, that was incredibly formidable for me yeah, to do, I can imagine. frankly. Um, well, for one thing, I had to come to terms with exactly how I was going to do this and why. And I chose, of course, to do it during the lost years, they call them, of Jesus, or the really the years you don't know anything about him because there's no record from the time he's 12 till around 30. So that's when I'm basically writing, except for a couple of instances. And so what is Jesus like at 20 or 18 or 26? You know, this was my question. Do we have this developing um, social prophet? Um, a Messiah in the making, that is, which means deliverer of his people. And I think in a lot of contexts, they understood that to be deliverer from Rome, Roman occupation, as well as from their sins, perhaps. And I just had to read so much historical Jesus scholarship to try to see all the facets I possibly could. But the most important thing for me in developing this character, which I did not take lightly, I assure you, um, was that I wanted to write him as his human side, his humanity, the human Jesus. And that formed his character more than anything for me and how he would be. So um, once I decided on that, that's how I wrote him. And as a novelist, that is very appealing to me to do it that way and to see him as just this Jewish man, you know, but a very extraordinary one. And I wanted to portray that too. Yeah, I think you did a, a beautiful job on it. Well, this has been such a, an incredible yeah. master class in, in writing. And thank you so much, Sue, for, for taking the time to talk to me. I always like to end the sort of best piece of advice that you ever received or that that you can give an aspiring writer about writing. Can you share something like that with us? I'm going to give you two. Oh, good. <laughs> two. I get a One. two <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this might be for like two cents worth, but one of the best things that someone told me was to discover your own truth, your own vision, your own voice, because that's where your power and your success as a writer lies in that, I believe. And the other thing I would say is that writing really does require vast amounts of courage. So if you're going to err, do it on the side of audacity. I love it. Well, those are wonderful words to end this interview on. Sue Monk Kidd, The Book of Longings, a wonderful book. Please pick it up. You can find it anywhere. And and thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me today. It was an absolute pleasure, and I wish you the best. Thank you for listening to Write About Now, hosted by my dad, Jonathan Small. If you like what you hear, you can support the show by becoming a patron. All you have to do is log on to Patreon. 
P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com backslash right about now podcast and pledge as little as $5 a month to get all sorts of valuable information on how to be a better writer. You can also follow the show on Instagram and Facebook or check his website at writeaboutnowmedia.com. Thank you for listening and always remember to do the right thing. Hey. Hey.